Your Excellency Muhammadu Buhari, President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces, Your Excellency Vice President elect Senator Kashim Shetima, all elected leaders here present. Your Eminence's traditional leaders here present, leaders of our different faiths here present, Your Excellency members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by saying a good morning to all of you, and at the very onset, to take this opportunity to thank you, President Buhari, and your entire team for inviting me to Abuja for the second time in under a year to engage together with you in meaningful discourse with leaders of Nigeria. I must, at a personal level, however, confess my great affinity to a man who I consider to be one of my closest colleagues when I was in government, but also a wise and sober father figure in the name of President Buhari. Indeed, as a son who retired before the father, I look forward to welcoming you to the very exclusive club of former African presidents. Congratulations to the people of Nigeria for choosing yet again to walk the more difficult path, to look past the challenges of a difficult election, and to embrace the learnings that come from a maturing democracy. In every high stakes contest, there will always be those who emerge victors and also those who will end up being losers. What has set Nigeria apart from many nations on our continent today is that its leaders have chosen to disappoint the naysayers and the prophets of doom and have opted instead to express their political differences within the framework of a constitutional order. <clears throat> this is not an easy thing to do when there are many other ways and means to express dissatisfaction, methods that could easily trigger civil unrest, lead to loss of life, and cause irreparable harm to your nationhood. In the unlikely event that no one has mentioned it to you, let me say it today that Nigeria is a country blessed with a generation of great need leaders, both inside and outside of the government, be they in Aso Rock, in Lagos, or Anambra. I salute you all for steering the nation peacefully up to this milestone moment. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I was invited here to speak on the topic of deepening democracy for development, a subject that remains close to my heart, and it is my hope that you shall permit me to speak freely and to say things as they are so that you can glean the most from my own experiences and observations as a former head of state. Experiences that not only celebrate success, but that equally acknowledges challenges. And I want to speak to you not as a Kenyan speaking to Nigerians, but as one African speaking to fellow Africans. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the last set of African nations to attain 
self-rule and independence from the shackles of colonialism and apartheid was 33 years ago in 1990 when Nelson Mandela and Sam Nyoma took the reins of their respective countries. One would have expected that three decades on from the departure of those who had oppressed, discriminated, and exploited our people for centuries, that our continent, Africa, would find herself to be not only more prosperous, but socially and economically stable. That we would have harnessed our immense God-given mineral wealth, our agricultural potential, and our abundant human capital to propel the well-being of our citizens and to strengthen our voice in the global community of nations. It is sad to note that today, many thousands of our children are migrating to Europe on fishing boats, fleeing from chaos and poverty, and braving harrowing dangers in search of a so-called better life. Over the last five decades, more than half the countries in Africa have experienced some form of armed conflict. African states have either been at war with each other or at war with themselves. Today, as I stand before you, there are at least 15 active theaters of non-international armed conflict on our continent, with a few more tittering on the brink. But we must go back and ask ourselves, why are we here? We must remember that when our borders were carved up in European boardrooms in the late 1880s, our societies were torn apart by boundaries that do not reflect how we would have chosen to organize ourselves. Traditional kingdoms were split or destroyed in their entirety. Those who shared common languages and other fraternal bonds found themselves on different sides of arbitrary borders. And in some cases, the colonialists imposed one community to superintend over others as part of their divide and rule strategy that would allow them to govern indirectly. In very few parts of Africa was any border drawn to accommodate religious and ethnic homogeny. As a consequence, we found ourselves inside countries that were somewhat a mixed bag. But I believe, as some would say, that you deal and live with what you're dealt with and make the most of it. Why do I say so? I say so because these differences in and of themselves are not fatal. They only become toxic if we as a people let them. We must start to see strength in our diversity if we are really serious about assuming our rightful place in this world as Africans. And why do I mention this? because it is important to understand the genesis of most of these conflicts and what impact they have on our development trajectory as a continent. We must strive to identify the natural fissure lines existing within our societies that make it so easy for conflict to thrive 
and for democracy to be undermined. Against this backdrop, we can drill down to what I feel and believe are the three fundamental issues that are so easily weaponized to the detriment of our democratic growth. The first of these is negative ethnicity or tribalism, followed by religion, and lastly, economic greed. When you look deeply at the crux of most of our conflicts within our continent, we are either fighting for ethnic or sub-ethnic superiority of one community at the expense of others, or we are propagating divisive narratives that have their origins in religious differences or sectarianism. As we sit here today, we know for a fact that some of these elements I have mentioned remain a clear and present danger for the future of Nigeria. The incoming administration has a unique opportunity to use this inflection point brought about by a peaceful and orderly transition to take stock of what sort of future it wants for the people of this country and for the future of this nation. Will Nigeria continue fighting for its place on the world stage with one hand tied behind its back? Or will it use this moment in time to embrace a brave new way of doing things and thereby unleashing the full might of this green giant? As you ponder on that thought, Allow me to take you back to a time in 2013 when I was first elected into office. At that time, I was facing the most serious challenge of my life, both as an individual and in my capacity as president. I was facing a trial at The Hague for alleged crimes against humanity, charges that were later proven to be unfounded. As I went on to settle into State House, I found myself introspecting more and more as to how I ended up in this unenviable position and what were the deeper issues and what these could be. I summarized at the time that it was an unfortunate side effect of the deeply contested 2007 elections that led to widespread inter-ethnic violence, causing the loss of some 1,300 lives and the displacement of over 600,000 Kenyans from their homes. At the center of this violence was fighting between the tribes or ethnic communities ostensibly associated with the leading political actors of the day. My predecessor and the third president of Kenya, His Excellency the late Mwai Kibaki, the leader of the opposition at the time the Honorable Raila Odinga, my successor and the fifth president of Kenya, William Ruto, and of course yours truly myself as the party leader of the then Kenya African National Union and a supporter of the incumbent President Mwai Kibaki. What started off as an election dispute over results between political parties 
very quickly escalated into a full-scale conflict between different ethnic communities whose perceived historical differences were easy powder kegs to ignite. How did we get to this low point? Whereas what happened in 2007 was unprecedented in its scale and ferocity, election-related violence was not a new phenomena in Kenya per se. We had seen some different manifestations of ethnic-based electoral violence from the early 1990s with the reintroduction of multi-party democracy. However, nothing was like what we were to witness in 2007 and 2008. With a country of 43 distinct ethnic communities, having been led exclusively by two tribes from independence, we had always found a way to gloss over the issues of negative ethnicity, hoping that by ignoring the issue, it would somehow sort itself out. Nothing could have been further from the truth. In fact, in the year 2002, after what many say was Kenya's first truly democratic multi-party elections, a new government was ushered in that raised the expectation of the citizenry. Hopes were high that equitable development, economic uplift would impact the lives of every Kenyan without discrimination. During this brief honeymoon phase, the country's economy boomed, with Kenya posting a real GDP growth rate of 6.9% at the close of 2007. However, trouble was brewing, and the coalition in power started to strain at the seams. The feeling that electoral promises on the distribution of political power among different communities were not being honored all came to the fore. The differences came out in the open when the first attempt was made at, at the constitutional referendum in 2005. The government-sponsored referendum bill was resoundingly rejected by we who were in the opposition, and unfortunately the stage set for a monumental fight in the run-up to the 2007 election. When the election came round, it seemed that the perfect trifecta had formed. The inequalities in development became more and more difficult to ignore. The feelings of some communities that they had been excluded from the national agenda or outrightly subjugated by the government of the day was palpable. All that was needed to ignite the, situ the situation was a closely contested election. And when that came, the tinderbox was lit. The rest, as we say, is history, and unfortunately the start of one of the darkest moments in Kenya's independent era. When the dust had settled, Kenya thereafter was to experience its most profound constitutional moment yet. The fear of a return to violence created the much needed environment for constitutional reforms that would transform the system of governance from that of a powerful central government to that of a devolved system of governance. The premise of the reforms was to find a way to guarantee equitable distribution of development across the entire country as a matter of right and not by dint 
of any political privilege. <clears throat> I am grateful to God for allowing me the opportunity to be the first president to implement Kenya's 2010 new constitution. However, that said, the years following the passage of this historic new constitution, the underlying issues around ethnic inclusion at the national level did not fade away. And the situation once again came to a head in 2017, almost 10 years to the month after the post-election violence of 2007. I, as head of state and government, was determined not to let history repeat itself. I had spent the last, the, the last two years of my first term trying to make up for the lost time that had been wasted running back and forth from The Hague. My administration was therefore working double time to try and fulfill our election pledges and to allow us the option to seek a fresh mandate in 2017. The 2017 election proved to be yet another milestone moment in my political life. For the first time in Kenya's history, the outcome of a general election had been overturned by the courts. Whether on account of judicial activism or plain ignorance, the decision of the Supreme Court to overturn my August victory and order fresh elections was all that was needed to put the country on an extremely dangerous footing. The constitutional lacuna surrounding the lack of defined and codified rules of engagement for the operations of government in the event of such a repeat election exasperated the situation even further. As the country prepared to go back to the polls for a second time on October 26, 2017, the main opposition parties made the decision to boycott the polls and whereas the victory of my party was all but assured, the victory came at a price. Once again, two communities had gotten their way yet again, and the much touted tyranny of numbers had delivered another victory with staggering efficiency. Indeed, the intelligence reports in the days and weeks after the election and my subsequent inauguration pointed towards growing intercommunal and interethnic unrest, more so in some hotspots, particularly in the mass urban settlements of Nairobi and in our lakeside region of our country. Our security services adopted a containment posture and did their best in, prevent, in preventing the situation from escalating. And as I was getting my daily updates, I was reassured that normalcy would be restored. And indeed it was. However, ladies and gentlemen, as it has been said by leaders across the world, peace is not informed purely by the absence of conflict. By the time Christmas of 2017 was approaching, it became clear to me that the calm that had returned to the country had been replaced by an inexplicable sadness and a tangible despondency that had seeped into the hearts and minds of large sections of our population. There were communities that felt defeated, that they had nothing more to lose, and that they no longer wanted to associate with a country known as Kenya because they felt that they had no stake in it. I was not the only one who sensed that there was more 
that buried this uneasy calm and that something serious and possibly more sinister was slowly brewing. The economy had not bounced back at the pace we had anticipated. Investors had adopted a wait and see attitude. And even though my coalition had an overwhelming majority in both houses of parliament, the politics seemed to be all wrong. And all this happening at a time when I was reconstituting my cabinet, putting in place the organization needed to deliver on the remainder of our pledges to the people of Kenya. And it was then that I was reminded about the inverse cor correlation between our election cycles and the country's economic performance. Whenever political temperatures went up, real GDP growth came down. The facts do not lie. In 1992, after the first multi-party elections, since the lifting of the ban on political pluralism, real GDP growth contracted to 0.8% from 1.4% the previous year. In 1997, it dropped to 0.4% down from the previous 4.5%. The same thing happened in 2008, when the economy virtually ground to a standstill. The long and short of it was that after every election from 1992, our country would take a hit for up to two years. Things would then settle, and shortly thereafter, we would be once again in campaign mood, and the vicious cycle would readily repeat itself. This meant that during every election cycle, thousands of jobs were lost, private investment and private sector confidence would shrink, and revenues to government would be strained, with adverse effects on our national development agenda. And it was then that I made possibly one of the most difficult decisions of my presidency, and I resolved two things. Firstly, that I would deliver on my development promise no matter what, and secondly, that I would not be the president that took Kenya back into any form of civil strife. <laughs> Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it was not weakness that led me to seek out the leader of the opposition at the time, the Right Honorable Raila Odinga. It was the appreciation that it was not about him, but rather the people whom he represented. <clears throat> the millions who felt excluded and marginalized by our brand of politics and the imperfections of our democracy. The things that we discussed in the days that followed and which culminated on the 9th of March 2018 in what we Kenyans commonly refer to as a handshake are the subject of another lecture. Suffice it to say that on that day, our country Kenya exhales a breath of fresh air and freedom. <clears throat> the dialogue that began was about what we needed to do to make Kenyans feel included in the affairs of their nation. It was about how we could strengthen devolution to deliver on what the framers of our constitution had intended. It was about how to make every Kenyan from large or small communities feel like the government was theirs. We recognize that when stripped down to its most rudimentary form, Kenya was simply an amalgamation of different ethnic communities trying to coexist peacefully within the borders that we found ourselves in. We recognize that for Kenya to endure 
as an indivisible nation, a winner takes all situation was not sustainable over the long term, and that the structures and organization of government would need to rethink to accommodate the realities of who we really were deep down. We concluded that ethnic big bigotry was a convenient cover for the vice of corruption, because it was always easy to say that it was our turn to eat, and whatever we were doing, we were doing for the sake of our people. <clears throat> Even as the country sighed in relief after the handshake, the weight did not lift from my shoulders, for I now had the arduous task of taking and carrying along with me on this journey those who had benefited from the previous status quo. That, my dear friends, was easier said than done. Many of those from my political strongholds could not comprehend why any political concessions needed to be made to those from other political parties, more so because many of the proposals meant that the tyranny of numbers wielded by the larger communities would no longer be an assured path to absolute power. They would have to contend with a seat at a much bigger table alongside many more people. The hardliners in my camp would remain skeptical and would take any bump along the way as an excuse to tell me to initiate a course correction. I would ask them, where do you want us to go? Do you want our brothers and sisters back on the streets? Do we want to go back to tear gas and rubber bullets to be our only tools of persuasion? This I flatly rejected, and I said, <laughs> and I took pleasure thereafter in reading intelligence reports that talked about other issues and not simmering ethnic tension. Contrary to the general expectation of the time, I did not dissolve government. I did not initiate the formation of a government of national unity. Both Raila and I knew that the issues we were discussing were too deeply rooted in our people's psyche to be resolved by some simplistic com cosmetic touch-ups. Touch -ups. After all, as they say, a pig with lipstick is still a pig. To some on both sides of the divide, the handshake was an inconvenient occurrence in the succession arithmetic. However, for me, it was the beginning of righting many wrongs that had been committed since our independence, wrongs that had led to lopsided development and a concentration of power, wealth, and opportunity in the hands of a few at the expense of the development of many. I can see my brother here is also concerned about my development. Thank you very much. Uh. My decision to pursue an agenda of inclusivity bore fruits in many ways. In the period from 2018 up to 2022, Kenya recorded some of its fastest development gains. It was the togetherness of the, of the Kenyan people that allowed my administration to steer the country through the difficulties of COVID-19 that ravaged both lives and livelihoods. It was the unity of purpose that allowed Kenya to play its rightful role in the international stage 
by securing a non-permanent seat at the UN Security Council and playing host to a multitude of international events. In 2022, it was this unity and sense of inclusion that allowed us to experience one of Kenya's most peaceful general elections while closing the year strong economically at a real GDP rate, growth rate of 4.8%. On the 6th of September, 2022, I handed over the reins of leadership to my successor, President William Ruto, in a colorful and peaceful ceremony. It was a proud moment for me and for Kenya. No matter what was felt about the outcome of the elections, we stayed true to our constitution. Although I completed my term in office, having not realized to my full satisfaction the agenda of de-risking Kenya's governance structures for the benefit of future generations, I remain committed to the cause because I feel that when we embrace inclusion, consultation, and consensus building in our politics, it only serves to improve the lives of our citizens. It is said that a day in politics is a very long time, and that politics remains the art of the possible. As I today settle into my retirement and shift my focus, time, and energy towards the peaceful resolution of conflicts on our continent, I remain alive to the fact that I must continue to play a part in fostering peace in my home country of Kenya. I use my voice and my platform to persuade, especially those in power, that a dialogue with those in opposition to their victory is not a weakness, nor is it a denial of their victory, but rather a much needed tool that creates a more inclusive Kenya and that sets a forward developmental trajectory. A trajectory that meets the expectations of all in our society. And I remind that the mentality of winner takes it all can only result in division and retardation of our national development agenda. Therefore, dear friends, as you celebrate victory of an election and prepare to inaugurate a new president, Remember that your victory is not just about numbers, as Western democracies would have us believe, but that the real victory will be how you will reach out to all the voices in Nigeria and how every Nigerian, from Katsina in the north to Port Harcourt in the south, from Bambana in the west to Maiduguri in the east, how they will all feel included in your victory and see and see your government as their government, your agenda as their agenda, one Nigeria, one government for all. And if I may address his Excellency, the President-elect, President Tinubu, through you, Your Excellency, Vice President-elect, I speak to you as a brother, but also as an elder statesman in leadership. The contest is now over, and the hard work of building a prosperous and unified Nigeria now begins. <laughs> Upon assuming the office of president, you would be wise to transcend from the tactical politics of an election and assume your role as Nigeria's vision bearer. This will demand a complete overhaul 
of the adversarial mindset that we as politicians are conditioned to embrace during the electoral process. As president, you must learn very quickly to lead those who love you and those who loathe you with equal passion and commitment because you are now the father of all. Your Excellency, when countries are in election mode, the people and its leaders are more divided than ever and boxed into their various sectarian and partisan interests. However, when you are the head of state and you take command of the country's armed forces, you become the embodiment of the sum total of the many different ethnic groups, religions that make up your country, and you become the symbol of unity, indeed, you become the face of Nigeria. I encourage you to surround yourself with the voices of those who will counterbalance the hardliners that feel entitled to a piece of your office. You will lose nothing and gain everything by reaching out across the political, ethnic, and religious lines to those who may feel aggrieved by your victory in one way or another, please allow them to exhale and be part of your vision for a greater Nigeria. It is my hope and my prayer that the lessons from across the continent will give you the resolve to walk the difficult path of overcoming those three enemies I started by I mentioning the three enemies of nationhood. Negative ethnicity, religious discrimination, and corruption. As your fellow African, I look forward to a Nigeria that emerges from this transition ready to flex and fight for its rightful place on the global stage with both hands at the ready. Your Excellency President Buhari, I once again thank you for your leadership. I thank you for your friendship. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all very kindly for your attention. May God bless you all. May God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria and her people. And may God bless Africa. Thank you very much.